All right, so this is a very detailed process. So I'm gonna give you guys like a whole agenda on basically what we will be talking about and what we will be doing. So after you create your grills, you have to do the sprue attachment and then you're gonna be working with investment. After that, we have the burnout process, the casting process, the quenching and cleanup process. And then afterwards we finish and this is when we polish and if you want a stone set, stone set, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. First thing you're doing after waxing up your grills is basically sprue attachment. This is basically when you have a firm wax sprue and it's basically going to flow and channel wax down to your piece. You need to make sure that these sprues basically, you know, have no bubbles, no blemishes around them because if it's not a perfect flow down to your piece, your piece won't get casted correctly. Now, in order to do this process, you need a couple of things. You're going to need your grill's wax up model, your sprues, a rubber base with thick wax sprue. I'll show you what that looks like. Everything's in the description below, by the way, and your wax pens. So let's get started. All right, so I'm going to show you guys how to do this process really quick because I feel like people would want to see how to do it, even though it's really, really simple. The whole purpose of sprueing up your wax model is to channel the, you know, whatever metal you're using down to your wax piece when it's in the investment. So basically the wax trunk in the middle isn't really big on the base that I use. So I make the wax sprues pretty short. Short. And you normally want to make them pretty short anyway because you don't really want to waste a whole bunch of metal trying to get it to your wax piece. Some people wax up with about four or five supports, some people wax up with two or three supports, but the way I was taught was to wax up with as many supports as you need in order to channel wax to about two teeth. So this first wax sprue is going to go somewhat in the middle but not directly in the middle because it's kind of hard to clean. So you're going to put it on like the edge of the tooth cusp and then do that basically on the rest of the models too. So I'm gonna show you what it looks like. I also know some people like exact measurements, so I went ahead and measured this for you guys, even though it's not really gonna help you, you wanna do something roughly around this, but roughly it's exactly 16.27 millimeters. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so when it comes to wax brewing up your wax models, I am not amazing with it. I'll ba I basically just get the job done. My piece is gonna come out with the metal, but I don't make mine look all great and all beautiful as some people do. So what I'm doing right here is I'm getting a wax sprue, putting it onto the piece, and then I'm getting my modeling wax, whatever you want to call it, and I'm putting that around the base of the wax sprue so there's no gaps in between the model and the wax sprue. Now when getting your next piece, you obviously want to make it make sense. So go ahead and get your wax sprue again. You're going to go ahead and lean it to measure how long it should be, and you're just going to go ahead and pop it off the way you see me do here. And then you're gonna do the same process and just melt it on to the um, wax sprue using your wax pens. So, like I said, you wanna to try to think of it as one wax sprue piece to every two teeth. But since these fangs are bigger, I'm gonna go ahead and reinforce them with another wax sprue just to make sure that the metal gets down to the fangs as well. So I don't know if you're paying attention, but I'm doing a slightly different method here. Right here, I touched the wax first and then I leaned it onto it and then I secured the top. So. You can do it many different ways. You can, you can melt the wax brew first and then put it onto the piece or put a drop of wax onto the piece and put the wax brew back on. So it's basically what you're doing the whole time. All right, so speeding it up a little bit one more last time. One more last time, does that make sense? And then, yeah, so now I'm gonna show you what it looks like. All right, this is pretty much what you're left with. Now this piece obviously will not be getting cast because it's ugly as heck, but I just wanna show you guys how to do a wax brew the proper way or a, a way, shoot, we're not gonna say proper. So the next steps in this process is getting your sprued up wax model onto your rubber base. Unfortunately, I don't have any of this stuff here because I don't really do any of this in-house. I, I did it at school and stuff like that. So I'm gonna show you guys from another person's video. This is from Aya's artist, Aya's artist. She's a YouTuber, go check her out. Her link's gonna be in the description as well. I'm shouting you out, homie. Don't act crazy because I'm using your video. You do good work too. Let's just support each other. All right, so this is the next step in the spring process. Right now, she's getting her base pretty right. I call this like the little nipple part because that's what it looks like. So she's getting like the base nipple filled with wax and then she's smoothing the wax on over. This is where I said my wax trunk I use is very small. The reason why she uses it like this is because it uses less metal, which makes basically makes you save money. So after you put wax in that circle, you can go ahead and melt it a little bit and then you're gonna set your wax sprue right into there. And this is basically what people call a wax tree. This is how they start making it like that. So the main important things when doing this, you want them to be pretty much almost straight up because when you put the flask around the base, you do not want your piece to be touching the flask. So pretty much exactly like this. See how none of the pieces are touching the edge or the rim? It's good. Now, if it is, go ahead and start over and reset the piece into the flask. Don't be All right, lazy. so two more things I wanted to point out before we move on to the investing part. Right now, as you look at her piece right here, it looks kind of wet, right? So she did this thing earlier where she sprayed some spray onto the pieces when she 
adhered the uh, wax spruce to the tree trunk. And I'm not really completely certain that this was what it was, but I think she sprayed a debubbleizer on there so that she doesn't have a lot of bubbles pop up when she casts it in metal. So if that was, because I didn't even really watch the video, but if it was a debubbleizer, you could also get that link in the description, but you want to use that as well if you want less bubbles to pop up on your piece. One other thing I wanted to show you guys was using a cellulose liner or a ring liner for your um, casting flask. So right there, that person is putting in a ring liner inside the casting flask, and this basically stops your pieces from shrinking. It's like insulation for your piece. Now, I was taught that overlapping line right here should be melted down with wax. So you put wax all over that overlapping line, and you just melt the wax onto the cellulose liner so that it has no gaps. But you can also just pour investment, overlap the ring liner, pour investment so that it holds it in place. And that's also a way you can do it too. But I like to melt the wax on that line so that there's no gaps. All right, so really quick, I'm no longer going to be putting things you need and like listing them all out in the video. Everything is going to be listed in the description below. So just go there, look at the checklist you're going to need for each section, and then continue the video from there on. It's just taking too much time to edit these little parts where I put things you need and then putting all the things you need. And then there's going to be a lot of stuff for each part. So just go to the description, check them out, and then continue your video. You'll be okay. All right, let's continue. So let's go ahead and get started with this next section. Start with two mathematical formulas. Yeah. All right, so the two formulas we're going to be using currently are W equals R squared times H times 3.14 times 8.2. Now, I know you're like, what is all that and why are we even using it? Basically, W is water, so we gotta find how much water we're going to use in order to mix with the investment. The reason why you wanna do this is because you don't wanna be wasting your investment. If you're gonna be doing a jewelry business, you wanna be able to account for everything that you use. So this is a good way to do that. Now, to find the investment, how much investment you use is gonna be 2.5 times the water. So whatever you find for water, you multiply that by 2.5, and that's gonna equal how much investment powder you use. Of course, we'll weigh out these numbers and that's how we get and, you know, use what we weigh. Now, if you hate math and you want to spend more money, you can also use Bella Vest SH. Now, Bella Vest SH is what dentists use. It's pretty much the same thing that they use for investment to make their, you know, their gold crowns and stuff like that. But it's a little bit more costly and it comes pre-packaged, which makes it easier, but that's why it's more costly. So, I mean, just learn some math and use your brain and you can save some money. All right, so obviously I'm not white. This is a friend of mine helping me out. This basically right here, once you have your water, you're gonna go ahead and find your investment by multiplying it by 2.5, like I said earlier. And then this is when you're gonna start weighing things out to start mixing soon. So you're gonna go ahead and get your rubber mixing bowl out and you're gonna go ahead and put on your scale, zero it out, and then you're gonna measure up to your measurements for investment. And you're gonna get a water bowl and do the same thing with your water. It doesn't have to be exact, but you want as close to the number as possible. Just some safety things, when using investment is very powdery, so you want to wear a mask just to make sure it's not getting in your lungs. It can be cancerous, it could hurt your lungs, you know what I'm saying? So just protect yourself and wear a mask. Now before you begin mixing, you want to get some things in order. You want to turn on your vacuum, get it all the way up to a negative 100 or 30 pounds of pressure. AKA just let it go all the way up to the max pressure. Another thing you want to do is make sure that your um, vacuum dome is pretty much clear. You want to make sure you're able to see your piece and your bowl through it so that you know you can see if it's bubbling over or not and it doesn't make a mess all over the place. And then you're also going to want to tape off your flask at the top because in case you go too far when pouring up your investment inside your flask, you basically don't want to make you want to make sure that it doesn't bubble over. Now once your tape is completely around the flask, now you're going to go ahead and start mixing up your investment. So what you're going to do is use a cake mixer, you're going to mix it inside it without it on first so the powder doesn't fly up, and then once it's decently mixed, that's when you're going to turn on your mixer and then mix it all together using a cake batter mixer. With this investment, I think you have about 5 minutes of working time. The way I like to do it is mix for a minute inside the bowl, put it in a vacuum for a minute, make sure all the air bubbles are rising to the top by knocking on like the metal plate where the um, vacuum hood is. And then you're just going to let the pressure build up. Now you're not letting it get all the way to 100. Remember, you're doing this for a minute. No matter what temperature, what um, number it gets to, once a minute is up, that's when you take it out and you're going to pour it into your flask. Remember, you also want to be watching your um, investment not to boil over or like spill over while it's in the vacuum. Now when it's come time to pour it into your flask, you're not going to pour it directly on your piece. You're going to pour it off to the side. And sometimes you'll even tilt the flask while you pour it just so that you know you don't pour it on your piece at all. 
If you look closely, I did not pour it all the way to the edge of the flask. It's poured only up to like almost the edge. Because remember, it could boil over and spill out of your flask. So now you're going to go ahead and let it go again for another minute underneath the vacuum. Now you're up to three minutes of working time. And remember, you want to keep track of this so you know that your investment isn't getting hard while you're doing all of this. You have about five minutes of working time, but you don't really want to use all that. Try to use about three and a half or four. Now once that minute has come to an end, you're going to release the pressure, take off your vacuum hood, and then you're going to pour the rest of your investment on top of the um, flask. Normally, if your investment has already hardened and you want to add more investment that's wet, don't do that because it won't even bond to your current investment that's poured inside your flask that's already hard. So you're only doing this if it's still wet, if it's still mobile, and you can, you know, play with it a little bit. Then you're going to set it aside and let it sit for about 45 minutes. I let it sit for more than that, maybe like an hour, you know, hour and a half, just to make sure it's definitely dry. And then that's when you go throw it in your um, kiln. So once you set your flask aside, you don't want to move it because right as soon as five minutes comes up, everything starts to harden. And if you move it a little bit, you might have a little gap from your wax model to your investment. I'm going to show you on the next slide once we're getting into the burnout process about why and how investment kind of works so you kind of get a more understanding of all this. So if you look inside this bowl right now, you can see how slow everything is moving. That investment's already harding. So imagine if you were to start moving this piece around, you might have some air bubbles and like deep spaces in between your investment. You don't want that. The burnout process. So I think now is a good time to discuss exactly what investing, burnout, and casting really is. So when you're investing, this is basically surrounding the wax pattern with a material that can accurately duplicate its shape and anatomic features. That's why investment is used because it's so flowy that it just makes it very simple to replicate whatever you have as your wax model piece. Once that happens, the burnout process then begins when you place it in the kiln, or I don't know how to say the word, I think it's kiln. But you place it in the kiln and that's when the burnout process begins by burning out the wax that you actually had in your mold. Once that happens, you then cast it using a molten alloy or a metal and that's when you sell off your piece or do whatever you want to do with it. With that being said, this process can actually be somewhat confusing because it kind of has a lot of different variables. Your temperature could be determined based on the type of alloy or metal you're using. It could be based on the type of thickness of your wax, how thick it is, or whatever investment you're also using. So. When it comes to the burnout temperatures and just this whole process in general, I'm going to give you guys the best gem you could ever look for. This guy right here, he goes over everything. He shows you exactly about the burnout process. He tells you all gems and information. He starts it off. He doesn't even have some lame intro and then getting into it. He gives you straight to the point all the information you need about the burnout process and some of the things you need to worry about, think about, all that kind of stuff. So watch his video in full and then you can come back to this one to see some of the finishing tips and stuff like that. But... This guy gives you the best gems you can possibly look for when it comes to the burnout process. So by this point, you just watch the video that I recommended. You understand the drying stage, wax elimination stage, the burnout stage, and the holding stage in the whole burnout process. And now you're pretty much ready to get your metal ready for casting. But how much metal do you use and how do you find out how much metal you use and what temperature do you burn it at and all that kind of stuff? Those are the questions you might have now. And that's what we're about to go over. The casting process. All right, so remember how I put this up on the screen earlier and I told you to weigh your rubber base before you put your wax ups on? So we're actually gonna use that part now. So the two things you needed are the rubber base weight and the weight of the rubber base with all these screws attached to it as well. All right, so the new formula, the new formula, what we're gonna do is use CBW, which is complete base weight. This is like the, what you see on the screen, your base plus the sprues. And we're gonna subtract that from the rubber base weight. This is why I said, weigh your rubber base before you add your sprues. And then this will equal your wax weight. Now you could do this a different way, just weigh your wax, weigh your rubber base, and then weigh your you know, sprue and wax base all together, but just make it easier by doing two steps instead of three. Now once you have your wax weight, you wanna multiply that times the specific gravity for the desired metal that you'll be using for your casting. So I have a general table right here um, for the carrots and specific gra gravity and all that. You can use this or you can go online and find the specific gravity of whatever precious metal you want to use or non-precious metal. But this is just like the simple ones that most people use, so I'll put this here for you. So as you can see, what I do is 2.7 times 13, and 13, I got that number from wanting 14 carats of gold. So I did 2.7 times 13, which equaled 35.1 penny weight. It's a pretty good just general rule of thumb to add 10% to your total weight. So what I did was 10% of 35.1 would be 3.51. 
And then I added that to 35.1, which gave me 38.6 penny weights of gold. And that'll be 14 karat gold because that's what I use from the specific gravity table. I hope that's pretty straightforward. I don't, if that's confusing, I'm so sorry, but that's as simple as it gets. Now, if you're still here, bro, I, I know you really want to do this. I know you really want to make jewelry and grills or whatever you want to make. So I'm about to put some more gems. I'm going to show you the process of getting all this stuff done. So basically, I'm going to show you what it looks like from getting your flask out the furnace, putting it on the vacuum, and then pouring your metal into the vacuum. It's all a bam, bam, bam process. It's not like a wait, wait, wait. It's a bam, bam, bam. So let's go ahead and look at how that looks. All right, so right here, my instructor, he's putting the amount of silver that we need for this cast. Uh, we didn't use 14 karat gold, but I was giving you guys an example earlier. And right here, he has a propane torch, okay? Um, I would say use the electric um, furnace to do it because it's easier. You don't have to use propane to set up all this propane stuff. But right now, he's just setting it up so we can go ahead and get it all done. Right now, my pieces are in the kiln. They're in the flask and they're in the holding stage or the ramp down stage where it's at... 1000 degrees below melting temperature so that's where my pieces are we're not on the vacuum yet or anything he's melting everything first and as you can see it's melting down pretty cool I, I love looking at this it's kind of therapeutic but anyway he's melting all this down first he then grabs a bit of borax and this kind of just purifies the metal a little bit because when you're doing this it gets oxidized and it turns it black and gets a lot of impurities on top of it he's putting the pressure up on the f on vacuum and this is where the pressure just rises all the way up to like 30 pounds of pressure or like max pressure. And then he's going to get my flask out of the furnace right now because we're about to pour the metal into the flask. So he's making sure the pressure is built in building up. You can see it's still melting. The fire is still going. And here I want to show you something. So if you look closely, he took it and flipped it upside down basically. So he's holding it now with the with like the divot up. So like this is a part that the um, rubber base was on. You're going to pour your metal inside that rubber base. I know a lot of people that's obvious, but to some people it's not. So I put it there. He then makes sure that the hole is positioned properly over the rubber vacuum thing. And then he just sets it down carefully. And he grabs some more borax and he sprinkles it on there to purify it one more time before getting ready to pour it. So remember, borax is just a purifier. It's going to be linked in the description as well, but it just helps your metal from being so oxidized and black, basically. From what I understand, I could be wrong about that. Who knows? Maybe. See the pressure still building all the way up to 100. And here we go, we go ahead and pour. And it pours really fast and really easy. So bam, just like that, all the metal's poured out. And now you have like a red hot button. And this is what you wanna wait for that red hot button to get black or just cold. And then you could go ahead and plunge it into your um, water to get all the investment off your piece. But yeah, this is pretty much the process. Showing you this one more time up close, this is what it looks like, it's red hot. The vacuum is still on, we can kind of leave it on for like two more seconds after we pour it just to make sure it's all the way sucked into the piece. But then after this, you're gonna go ahead and take your model, once it turns cold, like it's no longer red hot, it's just like black. You're gonna take that and plunge it into some water. From here, your piece looks like this. You cleaned it off, all the investment's gone, and now this is where you gotta cut off those sprues and start polishing and filing down all the big ugly parts. I, I, I partner, so I know that y'all like, wow, that's the it, that you're not gonna show the finishing part? Like, no, I'm not. I've been holding this video for almost a month now, man, and I've been working on it day in, day out, and I'm tired of working on this video. So I'm gonna make a part three to the whole grill, I think that's part four, actually, to the whole grills process I got going on, and then y'all gonna come back for more, okay? So I'm gonna see you in the next video. Peace, love, and happiness, and everything in between. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share. It's also love, man, because I really put my time into this and I ain't gatekeeping like all these other people on YouTube. So appreciate me appreciating you for trying to be out there and make good art. Love y'all. Peace.